But for the population, size and density we have, well, India's population is uh, more than United States, Russia, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Europe, entire Europe, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, put together. But we have only 900 deaths. So thanks to all our, they're called COVID warriors today. <laughs> One thing is the medical staff, the doctors, nurses and the allied thing, they, have, they are doing a great job. But the more important thing is the security agencies, the police, who are even teaching Surya Namaskar on the street <laughs> They are making all young people do Surya Namaskar on the street if they break the social distancing norms or sit-ups or whatever. Hats off to them, otherwise hospitals would be inundated and still our medical infrastructure is not stretched. They have created nearly quarter million dedicated COVID beds across the country. We are nowhere near that, it's all empty and waiting. So, we have to thank the state police and the central agencies and of course the political leadership which came together as one, irrespective of political parties, they all came together as one and implemented this lockdown. Now many of the states are choosing to further the lockdown for some more days or weeks according to the situation there. And in Tamil Nadu, only three hundred districts uh, no I'm sorry, in India three hundred districts are completely COVID free. Two hundred ninety-seven districts, no hotspots. Only one hundred and twenty-seven districts have hotspots. Thirteen districts in Tamil Nadu no new case in the last five days. Thanks to everybody who made this happen. Above all, we have to congratulate the Indian people. Everybody thought these are the most indisciplined, confused lot of people, but they... <laughs> At least nobody's in India is complaining, oh, I need a haircut. <laughs> that is something else. So, uh, that's the situation. Well, at a time like this, many, many questions. I was just on the national news channel and uh, the question is always about Somebody is making use of all the dry leaves for me, it's okay <coughs> uh, I'm sorry. The question is always about how will we cope with this, our mental condition, how are we going to maintain our mental balance post this lockdown? because many of us would have lost our jobs, our incomes would have come down, our lifestyles may have to be curtailed. Well, many, many things. There's going to be a whole lot of economic pain for everybody, nobody will be spared. So, that is true, but when a pandemic swept through the globe, post-pandemic you're still alive. Does it need celebration or suffering? <laughs> it needs celebration, you're still alive, that means celebration only. Because it could have killed you. You think all the people who died are bloody idiots? 
they're like you and me. Somewhere they caught it, they don't even know, most of them don't even know where they caught it. That's it. So, if we stay alive, you know, yesterday I was talking to all the vice-chancellors of various universities, there's a vice-chancellor association or whatever they call it. All the university chiefs to that group I spoke yesterday, they're saying uh, from now on we have to refer to the world as BC and AC, before corona, after corona. Academics are preparing for a history lesson. So, if that's how we're looking at it, <laughs> it's time to understand that we have spent too much time fixing the world, fixing it to a point of destruction. Normally the word fixing something means improving something, making it better. Something that was not working, you made it work, that is… Me that means you fixed it. But we fixed it in a different way, in a destructive way, to a point where almost everybody knows today, if we continue, no, not like how you are right now in lockdown, I'm saying if we continue business as usual, in twenty, twenty-five years, thirty years' time, there's going to be a major disaster. There's no question about that. There is no question in anybody's mind about that anymore, in terms of the impacts of climate change and stuff like that. But we've been continuing. At least this virus has put the pause button, not stop, pause button. Look at all the noise we're making about this. Two months, if you stop your economy, everything is going to go away. No, no, it's not like that. It is like this. You put something, let's say you put this vessel in front of a mirror, Then you see two vessels. Then you set up a shop with two vessels. But then you bought one more mirror. Then suddenly you had hundred vessels. Then you set up a full-fledged wholesale shop, one hundred vessels. But then a storm came, a virus came, a tsunami came, something came. Fifty vessels got wiped out and you're crying, but actually you had only one. You always had only one. So what wealth is there upon this world, what possibilities are there are not gone. It is just our idea of wealth today is building it up in the air. Stock market is the indicator of our wealth. Well, that's the kind of economic system we've built, I'm not making a commentary on that, but we don't have to be so distressed. When I was interviewed by one of the national medias about ten years ago, they asked me about a question about Indian stock market. Because that day for the first time, uh, I'm, I may be wrong on the years, uh, maybe twelve, thirteen years, maybe, it had breached the Indian stock market, had breached the twenty thousand mark, never before it had hit twenty thousand. <coughs> so, they asked me, what do you think about it? I said, see, in my estimate, if you look at the businesses and their capacities, the industries, what they can produce, what they can do. The stocks in reality are worth about maybe twelve thousand is where it should be. But of course we want to create a positive sentiment, so we'll make it fourteen thousand. We'll 
because human sentiment drives it, fourteen, fifteen thousand. Twenty thousand is a bit too much. Well, since ten, ten years, it crossed uh, I think forty-four thousand or forty-five thousand in the last few months. Today it's come down to I think twenty-eight or twenty-nine thousand, I'm not on it. Somewhere around thirty thousand, everybody's crying because so many people have lost money, of course. That is painful for them because that is the game they were playing. But essentially, nothing has changed except numbers on the computer. So we're building a world like this. A world like this means, this has always been said in yoga, that with a simple desire, you'll create a whole new world and you believe it's real. Whether it's your business or money or wealth or family or whatever love affairs and stuff you have, all built in your mind. Out of simple desire, you're making a world out of it and you think it exists. When it vanishes, either in the form of tsunami, storm, just a stock market crash or virus or somebody's death, suddenly you are so disturbed by it because what you had built up in your mind just went away. Not just you, all of you got together and built up the same thing, then it's like real, it's just like a religion. Everybody gets together, builds up the same imagery in their mind. It becomes real, they start seeing the heaven, they talk discussing the whole same thing among themselves. They build up a whole new creation of their own. If somebody from outside comes and questions, normally they kill them because he's threatening the stock market. He'll just bring down the sentiment totally. So there is there is definitely going to be pain in terms of my concern is for the poorest of the poor who will… Uh, who may be deprived of their basic livelihood, but they will… usually they are quite ingenious, they will find their way with little support, three, four months support is there means they will find their way in some way. But in terms of what one may be enjoying, it may be a backward step. Let us say, if we just look back, how we were living ten years ago, how many things we had, I'm not even talking a generation, just ten years ago, how we were, how we are today, we have many, many more things. If you leave us for another ten years, we will have many, many, many more things and it'll go on and on and on. But on this planet, there is no more, there's only that much. There's only one vessel, rest is all mirror images. Now, ten years ago, were we in some deprived condition? We were doing fine. I'm telling you, if you look back hundred years ago also, when nobody had anything like this, even then they were fine. Ten thousand years ago, if you look back, even then when they lived in the jungles and wherever, then also they were fine in their own way. Maybe they didn't drive an automobile, maybe they were not whatsapping, ah, but they found their own way. They developed a big voice and shouted at each other or beat a drum or did something, all right. But they also lived a complete life in their own way. So, economy goes backward, it's just a pain of adjustment. And those who are little weak may get crushed in the process, that is the only concern. Otherwise, economy steps back is not a genuine concern, it's not a real concern, it's okay. And anyway, as we can see, all the birds and animals are saying, let's make the planet great again. I think this is a good election slogan next time around. Let's make this planet great again. If human beings also said the same thing, tch, it would be fantastic. Economic engine is simply running, running, running. 
you can't fix it when it's running because it's running. Now this virus has brought the economic engine to a pause, to a halt. It's a good time to fix it, it's a good time to rejig it because it's stopped. If you don't fix it now, when it gets moving again, will you fix it? Definitely you will not. So this is a good time. I know it is not something that we can do overnight, but this is a good time to start thinking how else to run this world. Right now, the very way we are measuring it is, just whoever has more is more successful. Somewhere we have to create this, whoever has too much is a bloody fool in the world. Yes, but that's not happened. This happened during Lao Tzu's time. The king found Lao Tzu so wise and he said, you must be my minister because you're the wisest man in the country. Who else should be the minister? You should be the minister. Lao Tzu said, see, I'm not fit for these kind of things. Please leave me alone. The king said, no, 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 you are the wisest man in the country, so you must be the minister. Then Lao Tzu said, see, out of my wisdom, what steps I take may not be conducive for you or for the people in many ways. Out of my wisdom if I act, you and many other people may not approve it. He said, how will I disagree with your wisdom? I'm I've become a complete fan of yours or devotee of yours. How will I disagree with you? I admire your wisdom. No, don't you worry about such things, you become a minister. They made him a minister. A few months rolled by and then it so happened. <coughs> a young man who was working in a very rich man's house, almost a palace kind of place, stole a piece of jewelry from the house. The jewelry was left outside in the garden by the rich man's daughter and a bird picked it up and went and sat on a tree, so it was on the branch and it left it there. The man looked at it, the young, the young man who is working there, he, sa he thought, I'm not stealing this, the bird has already stolen this, it's on the tree. If it had dropped it outside the compound, anybody could have picked it up, but it's on the tree and he is badly in need of financial assistance. So he picked it up and tried to go and sell it, immediately caught. So the rich man wanted him beheaded, <laughs> his head should go. So he was brought to the court, Lao Tzu is the judge that day. He looked at it and he said, the rich man should get fifty lashes. And the poor man should get ten percent of the rich man's wealth. The rich man freaked, what is this rubbish? This guy has stolen jewelry from my house and I get fifty lashes and I have to give away ten percent of my wealth to him. He went to the king, what is this rubbish? The king was shocked, why would Lao Tzu, the wisest man in the country do such a thing? Then he called Lao Tzu and said, what is this? I, I'm not questioning your wisdom, but what is the basis of this judgment? So Lao Tzu said, first of all, why has this man amassed so much that when a precious jewel goes missing, he doesn't even notice it? That means he has too much, he has stolen from everybody, so he needs fifty lashes. And the poor man, I looked at his life conditions, he needs ten percent of the wealth, so it must be given to him. And he's been traumatized that his head is going to be taken away, 
for that the rich man should pay and twenty... Uh, ten percent of his wealth must go to this man. The king looked at him and said, please sir, you must resign <laughs> Your wisdom <laughs> Your wisdom I appreciate but we can't run this nation by your wisdom. So, we are complaining and complaining, but you see the birds are saying, let's make the planet great again. While everybody is talking about it, that even in Delhi the air is clean, people are feeling good. And uh, from Punjab, they're able to see Himalayan peaks for the first time in twenty years. Always it was smoggy with smoke. Now because of the lockdown, they're able to see Himalayas. For thousands of years people have seen Himalayas from Punjab, from Delhi, from all these places. But now we can't see because it's all smoggy all the time. So now that you're watching the Himalayas, and you're even appreciating and beginning to enjoy it. Is it not the time to rejig how many machines should run, what kind of work we should do, what we should not do, what is necessary, what is not necessary? Can we live with a little less? Everybody should look at it. If you make it a law, it becomes ugly. If it happens consciously, it's fantastic, you know. So, this is definitely a time. If we want to do this, this is not going to happen from outside. Because you know the great experiment, Karl Marx, I don't know how many of you are exposed to him because those of you who come from the West, he is a devil. Uh, in India at one time everybody was reading Marx, not anymore. They only read comic books these days. So Marx is a... a very compassionate human being. He thought, if you bring communism in its purest form, not the way it is today, <laughs> that means everybody lives according to their needs and fantastic life. This can only happen when human beings have great regard, respect and love for each other. But he thought he could do it politically and what a mess. What a mess, because wherever they try to bring communism, in major ways, the number of people who died because of this is unbelievable. In the last... in the twentieth century, over hundred million people have died for this one ideology, but this is for the people. This whole ideology is about the people, the significance of common people. Over hundred million people, they can't be kings, there were no hundred million kings, ordinary people who died, hundred million people. So, this is because a great idea, you try to implement it from the wrong end, this is a disaster. This can be done in so many ways, but uh, today, Why communism failed is because Marx uh, might have known so much about the economy and stuff, but he failed to understand human nature. He genuinely believed, he openly spoke about it, that the first nation which will become communist is United States. How wrong is he? Mr. Sanders is trying but that's not going to happen. He thought the wealthiest nations in the world will become communist and then they will share with everybody and we will create a wonderful world. Great idea. But always the poorest of the poor became communist in the world. Even today, it is always the poorest of the poor who are communist. What this essentially means is, those who have something, 
do not want to share. Those who don't have anything want to share. <laughs> so in the end, instead of becoming a great romantic philosophy, it just becomes an ideological robbery. So, you have wealth, I have nothing, I will talk about sharing. You know from where the sharing will happen. You don't agree, ah, we'll take your head off and share it among ourselves. This becomes ideological robbery. Ultimately, unfortunately, that's how it ended up. What was a great philosophy, at that time, every thinking person in the world was so excited about communism. They thought this is the greatest ideology, the world will change. But just the reverse happened because those who have don't want to share, those who don't have want to share, terrible idea it became. So, this happened. I never told you about Chank Shankaran Pillai's childhood, did I? No. When Shankaran Pillai was a twelve-year-old boy, one day he went out and he brought a hundred rupee note. Those days hundred rupees is lots of money. And uh, he brought a hundred rupee note and he said he found it on the street. His mother looked at him and said, did you really find it? on the street. Just, just checking if the boy stole the money or something. He said, no ma, I definitely found it, it was on the street. I even saw that man looking for it <laughs> So, this is happening from outside, it'll become ugly. Even now what I'm talking about rejigging our economy should not happen from outside, it'll become ugly. Again, with loss and force, it won't work. It needs to happen with a certain sense of inclusiveness. When... Uh, when Parvati came to Adi Yogi, and she's a proud woman, princess, So she is seeing uh, the Saptarishi sitting there in a very dedicated, committed way. Years and years are going by, Shiva is talking and talking and talking, trying to import this science. Every step is taking such a long time for them to understand, grasp, experience. Soak it in, it's taking time. But the privilege of being a wife gives her a little bit of a swagger. Then uh, she says, I want to know this too. But Adiyogi knows, she will never sit like this in front of him for years and years and learn step by step. He looks at her and he says, you come sit here. Then she thinks that's an insult, that means you're questioning my intellect, you're just saying, come sit on my lap. He says, no, no, come. Then he touches her in one hundred and fourteen different ways and she becomes a part of him. By being a part of him, she knows everything that he knows, but she still maintains her individual nature. This is the only way you can transform the world. You need to touch them in ways that in some way, there is some integration, there is some union, there is some inclusiveness. When inclusiveness happens, then you don't have to use force to change anything. Right now, anyway, the force has been applied by the virus. I am talking about taking advantage of this situation. But unless every nation goes for it, that's not going to happen because we are always afraid somebody will run away ahead of us. This problem is there. So we must do the bird call, let's make the planet great again. What the birds are saying, if the same sense enters into every human mind, 
and all of us start thinking in terms of making the planet great again, rather than my country get great again because as I said, for an ideology, hundred million people have died in a century. For the sake of religions that you believe in, we nobody counted how many millions have died, endless number of people have died. The next largest tyranny is nationalism. For the sake of the nation, people die, even today, proudly die. Well, it is very necessary right now to protect the borders of a nation the sovereignty of a nation, because still my piece of planet versus your piece of planet, fighting is going on. In some way, we need to relax the boundaries of nations. National boundaries have to be relaxed. That is not possible when there is so much economic disparity. If we reasonably bring it to some level, it is like chicken and egg, which should happen first. No, all these things must happen together. Somebody should have the wisdom to bring all these things together. If national boundaries become not totally obliterated, at least little loose, then who will build an army? For what? For, you know, for whatever internal situations you may have a force, but you will not have such mega forces right now, which are capable of destroying the planet over many, many times. They've got enough weaponry, even the next planet that we may go to, suppose we go to Mars and we want to destroy that, for that also we have enough bombs and armaments and everything. So we prepared for three planets' destruction, but we have only one. Really forward thinking. Uh, so <laughs> We have to... We don't know if that will even happen in this generation, but if this generation start thinking on those lines, maybe next generation will implement it. If this generation starts thinking... See, once you start thinking in a certain direction, knowingly, unknowingly you will start going there. You don't have to necessarily forcefully march in that direction. Once you start thinking, let's say you started thinking Wellingiri Mountains, Wellingiri Mountains, Wellingiri Mountains, Wellingiri Mountains, unknowingly you will be somewhere around here. That's how it is. That's the nature of a human being. So we should get people to think beyond the boundaries and borders that we have set and above all, this endless need that we have created, one important thing for this to happen is we must destroy. I'm saying this very consciously, very consciously. <laughs> for all those, because I'm smiling, people think I'm not serious, I'm very serious. We must destroy the present education system if we want to do some genuinely positive things about the ecology, because that is where the key is. Yeah.